Faith, good to see you guys all here today. Uh, why don't you stand with us and we'll start singing. Yeah. 
Holy, holy. 
darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. God, we come this morning to see you, and in doing so, to see victory. For all the areas in our life that are facing upheaval and disconnect and stress, we look to you this morning and we ask that you would guide us into your word and into your presence, that you would receive the glory. Be among us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. So I'm Pastor Steve and Pastor Michael, and Pastor Michael decided to take a weekend off. <laughs> so you get me this morning. Once upon a time. How many of you like a good story? How many of you, how many of you love to read so much that you can get lost in a book for hours? There it is. Long story short, that's what we're talking about today. How many of you'd rather watch the movie than read a book any day? Okay. Right? No, there's no fault. It's what you like. 
Think about it. What's your favorite book, movie, story, sermon? <laughs> oh, is that supposed to be funny? <laughs> oh, my favorite movie is The Princess Bride. Best movie ever. My wife hates it. She doesn't like it at all. Uh, on the other hand, Becky loves a good Hallmark movie. Me not, yeah, me not so much. Listen, if it looks like a Hallmark movie, if it sounds like a Hallmark movie, if it smells like a Hallmark movie, I've already seen it. It doesn't matter if it's before Christmas or after. It doesn't matter if it's snow or whether the players change or the situation changes or what little town they're in, I've already seen it. <laughs> and uh, you might have too. Have, anyone, have any of you ever had the privilege of hearing a really good storyteller? A lot of times they'll start just like we did earlier, once upon a time. And when you hear that, you kind of lean forward a little bit. You kind of anticipate your ears, if it were your mouth, it would start watering. Your ears kind of prick up because you know a story's coming. We hope, we hope it's going to be a good story. Because we've all heard stories that weren't. Stories with no plot. Stories with no point. Stories with no imagination. Stories we just don't care about at all. A hundred years ago, Ernest Hemingway won a bet with some friends. It was a bar bet. He bet them that he could write an entire novel in six words. A novel, so it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Six words. He won the bet. This is what he wrote. For sale, baby shoes. Never worn. Now, in a story like this, what's not said is just as important as what's said, right? And we automatically, when we see a story like this, start filling in the blanks. But we fill in the blanks based on us, based on our experiences, based on the stories that we know that we have a connection to. Why weren't the shoes ever worn? Well, maybe you fill it in this way. It's a tragedy. A heart-lost story, perhaps about a miscarriage or a stillborn baby, a baby that died of sudden de uh, infant death syndrome, SIDS. Because you might already have a connection with a story like that. Or perhaps you fill it in in a way that isn't tragic at all. Perhaps this was shoes sized for a preemie and mama just had a nine pound baby. Never worn. Perhaps they were girly shoes, now popped a boy. Never worn. Or perhaps there was this baby shower and these shoes showed up and mama hated them. <laughs> and they were in the first garage sale they could possibly have. Right? We all know stories like this. It doesn't matter the why or what, but we fill them in based on our own experiences. The six-word story of Hemingway's has led to an, an, an entire genre, an entire category of writing called flash fiction, stories that are put together in six words or less. For example, the psychic said I'd be richer. Or this, after cancer, I became a semicolon. Maybe this one. Machine. Unexpectedly, I'd invented a time. Okay, some of you will wake up this morning around 2 o'clock thinking, okay, it still wasn't funny. But I finally got it. He read his obituary with confusion. I mean, you have to ask, is that a good day? At least you're still kicking to read your own obituary. Or maybe this one. We closed on our house. Finally. Now this one's actually, this is actually not fiction at all. This is a true story. Becky and I closed on our house 10 days ago. This is our first house ever, and we're pretty excited about it. It's here in town. 
Thanks. It's here in town, which means you're kind of stuck with us for a while, so. Unless I have to start preaching more, and then you'll, right, find a curb to kick us to. Now, this actually happened, but there's no way that six words can tell you the entire story. We get that. There's no way that it can tell you the excitement, the anticipation, the frustration, the worry that the other shoe is about to drop. And it's not going to close, it's not going to complete, it's not going to come together. There was this whole range of story um, that, that goes on. And for some people, for you guys who know us, you might care a little more. It might be a little more interesting. The backstory might actually have a point. But not for the guy at the paint store. He doesn't care. He's more like, oh, you bought a house, great. Gonna need some paint. <laughs> and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's kind of his job, and that's the only place his story intersects with ours. But for those of you who know us, who've been around a while, you've got a relationship, and the backstory's a bigger deal. It matters a little more. It might even be interesting because you know the characters in the story and you've already found a place in our story. Does that make sense? <clears throat> the grand epic adventures of Stephen Becky story. We've all got one. Everything takes place there. The romance, the mystery, the on the rocks, the catastrophes, the breakthroughs, those very thin thread moments where you wonder if we're ever going to get through it. And all of those kind of tie together to, to wind us up at this point. The epic adventures of Steve and Becky. We've all got a story like this. The backstory is only interesting if you care about the story. Pick any movie. If you're not into the movie by the time it gets to that point and they start in a backstory, you don't care. You're going for more popcorn. Now, how many of you have ever sat through a boring movie? Why? Well, maybe it is because somebody recommended it to you and you're trying to figure out what in the world they saw <laughs> and liked. Or maybe that Hallmark movie is important to the person you're with, so you sit through it because the person you're with is more important than the movie you hate. <laughs> Or maybe that's just me. Oh, I see that hand. <laughs> right? There's reasons that we'll sit through things that we aren't connected to. Here's another question. How many of you have ever gone to see a movie, or maybe even read a book, that you expected to be horrible, terrible, boring, awful, and it turned out better than what you expected? Anybody? Okay. Sometimes it just takes giving it a little leash, giving it a little bit of a chance to get into it. All right, everybody stand up. No, really, everybody stand up. If you're at home watching, the, come on, stand up. All right, on the count of one, we're going to do this. That's not the back. All right, we missed a slide, no big deal. On the count of one, uh, we're going to do this. Tell me the name of that movie, that story, that book, everyone together, that you thought was going to be awful, but was better than you thought, OK? Tell me the name of the book or the movie that you thought was going to be terrible, but turned out better than you thought. On the count of one. Ready? Three, two, one. Some of you chickens couldn't even get it out of your sit down. <clears throat> Why that? Because you just participated in the creation of this message. So if you hate it at the end, I'm not the only one to blame. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, the other thing with that is because you participate, all of a sudden you are instantly, at least slightly, more engaged in what we're talking about because you had part in creating this. And that's true with any story. When you're participating, there's more engagement in it. I got notes because I don't do this often, and I got to find myself in my notes. All right, one more question. This one's a little tougher. How many of you have ever sat down with the Bible and felt disconnected with it? I have. I'm not looking for a plastic Sunday morning answer. Yes, we're great after our kids were just 
beating each other on the two-minute drive over to church, and you had them both by the throat the same... Maybe that's just me. <laughs> How many of you have ever sat down with the Bible and felt disconnected? It's a common thing. It's not unusual. <sighs> and I don't have all the answers, but I can offer one simple explanation. If you've never gone through it, you don't know it. And like any story, if you're not connected with it, if you're not participating in it, it's, a little, it's more distant. You're a lot more concerned with your parents, your grandkids, your children, than you are the guy across the street who you probably never met, got his name, whatever. His story, nothing against him, but how involved are we in that? That's the reality of things. Is the more we're involved in a story, the more it matters. And the Bible's the same way. If you've never gone through it, you don't know it. Disconnection in any relationship is unhealthy. One of our tendencies as the human race is to make things worse. We take relationships that are disconnected and we fracture them. We take relationships that are fractured and we break them. We take things that are broken and we start pulling them apart and separating them. That's what we're good at. We're not so good at putting things together. Relationships or anything else, that's one of God's specialties. Some of you are still kind of stuck in the point of where I said having a relationship with the Bible, and I get that. Um, having a relationship sounds weird with a Bible or any other book. It can. It's one thing to a relate it's one thing to relate to a book or a movie or a sermon. It's another thing to have a relationship with it. Relationships are something you have with people. Living, breathing people, maybe a pet. Okay, because relationships are based on give and take. What you bring to the table, what you invest in the relationship, as well as what you can withdraw or get out of it or, or just have a piece of. That's how relationships work. That's why relationships matter. So to have a relationship with the Bible may seem odd, but here's the thing. The Bible claims to be a living entity. The Bible claims to be alive. That may be surprising. It may sound weird. It might be unbelievable, but before we dismiss the idea completely, let's take a look at some scriptures. This is what the Bible says about itself. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now aren't you excited? But it does say it's alive and powerful. John 1, first verse, says this, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the 14th verse explains it a little better, a little, a little more completely. The Word became human and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is described as God's Word. So all of a sudden, having a relationship with God's Word, having a relationship with Scripture, having a relationship with the Bible isn't quite so far-fetched. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've started asking people, started gathering opinions, not the plastic Sunday school <laughs> opinions, but those kind that we kind of dig around a little bit and kick the tires on. What's your relationship with the Bible? That's what I've been asking people. That's what I've been exploring with people. What is your relationship with the Bible? Not the one you tell Pastor Michael about when he's Right? Here on a Sunday. The one that you tell your buddies about when you've had a drink and you're trying to just dig through some stuff because it's a mixed bag, usually. There have been a lot of different answers. Some people think the Bible is just an outdated book of advice and teachings and fairy tales. Other people see it as a source of inspiration, a guidebook. Some people told me that regularly getting into God's Word is super valuable for them. Others said it was way too long. 
Oh, okay, so we're getting into it. There were also some particular words that kept popping up when I asked people about their relationship. Words like responsibility and heavy, overwhelming. And this word, this little word, should, it sounded like this. I should read it more. I should be more consistent. I feel like it should be more enjoyable. Where does that come from? Well, maybe our whole lives of being in church should. There's a lot of that in church. Here's the thing. Any relationship based on should needs help. Any relationship. If I'm only fixing the problem I started with my wife because I should, I need help. If I'm only reading the Bible because I should, something's missing. Can we, can we just be honest? I mean, even, even on a Sunday morning, can we be honest? This, let's be, church is the least honest place, right, sometimes? How are you? Fine, how are you? How's your relationship with the Bible? Great, how's yours? Should. Anytime dealing with a problem, dealing with an issue becomes a chore, we're, we're missing out. It tends to make things worse. But like any book or movie, if we kind of knew what to expect heading into the Bible, it might make it easier to get engaged. Even if we're hoping, if, if all we're hoping is that the story turns out better than what we expect. Um, heading into The Princess Bride, we know it's this action-adventure movie. So we know what to expect. There's going to be a hero. There will be a damsel in distress. There's going to be some bad guys. And because we know what to expect, we can start finding our place in the story. We can, we can identify with the hero or the damsel or just want to be one of the bad guys and right, take her off. Um, heading into a Hallmark movie, we all know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> we know there's a career woman somewhere who's lost in her work. And for some reason, she has to go to this small remote town where there's an eligible bachelor <laughs> just waiting, right? And he's going to teach her the real meaning of the holiday. And snow falls, and they kiss. And there's a dog in there somewhere. We, we know this story. But because we know what to expect, we kind of know when it's, finally, coming to an end. We know when it's, we know how to interact with the story. No, honey, you enjoy this. I'll go get more popcorn three hours later. If we could get that sort of handle on the Bible, I think it would help our relationship with the Bible. It would help us know what to expect. It would help us to know where we are in the story, help us to find our place in the middle of it, and how to identify with it. So today, for the sake of each of our relationship with the Bible, I want to present it to you as a simple, short story. Yes, the entire Bible. Yes, there's an amazing backstory in there. But we've already said, if you can't get a handle on the story, the backstory, eh, it's not going to matter quite so much as if we can find ourselves in the story to begin with. So we're going to look at the story arc of the Bible as a short story. Does that make sense? Um, we're going to build it a piece, of time, a piece at a time as well, all right? So here we go. Short story long, in the beginning, God. This is the cornerstone for the entire Bible. This is the premise that everything is based on. In the beginning, God. The entire story of the Bible. This is also the buy-in point. The Bible saying something right up front, very beginning of Genesis, in the beginning, God. It's making a claim that there's a God, that he exists, and that he, in fact, existed before the very beginning. Now, if we can get our heads wrapped around this, this one little idea that in the beginning, God, I'm telling you, everything else in the Bible will start to fall in place because we've accepted in the beginning, God. Now, even if you're not there yet, that's fine. You can do what we do all the time in movies, and you can suspend your 
decision, the, the, the dispens- suspension of disbelief, they call it, where when someone says, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and you're like, okay, that's what it's going to take to get into this story. The ninth one, finally, I hope it... <sighs> no, it's what we expected. Thanks, Disney. And Star Wars is done for a minute. Yeah, some of you are shaking your heads knowing it's this sad, distressed look because you know they're going to just stir that pot again. This is how the book of Genesis opens. And it also makes sense from a story standpoint because you can't start the Bible with once upon a time because the point of the Bible actually started before time was even a thing. In the beginning... God. Step one. In the beginning, God. Long story short, in the beginning, God created everything, including the human race. And God declared everything good, including the human race. The first chapters of the book of Genesis don't just account for how we arrived here and why we arrived here. They also lay out, lay out the ground rules that God established when we showed up the rules that he designed when he created life, why things are the way things are. In the beginning, God created everything, including the human race, and God declared everything good, including the human race. Kind of also starts to explain why we are the way we are. Do you know there's two innate desires that are born into every baby when they're born? The first one is this, design, this desire for ownership. We want to have things and call them our own, which is why you can see a toddler crawl across the room, yank a toy out of someone's head, another toddler, bang him on the head with it and say, mine. <laughs> we can also see a second desire that's innate. It's born within each of us, and <sighs> that's the need for recognition to be seen and valued, which explains why a kid will be on a playground or be on a diving board and say, look, mommy, daddy, watch. We've all seen that. We've all done that. We've all been that. Can you imagine what it feels like for your heavenly father to look down at you and say, perfect? He does. Can you imagine what it's like for the creator of the universe, God in heaven, to look down on you and say, just right. He does. Step two, in the very beginning, God declared everything he had made, including you and me, good. Long story short, in the beginning, God created everything, including the human race. And God declared everything good, including the human race. Then, the humans disobeyed God. And their disobedience resulted in a broken relationship with God. Once they broke the relationship, they couldn't fix it. Again, we're not good at the fixing part. We're really good at the breaking part. Because they couldn't fix it, what did we do? We lived in that broken relationship. Have you ever lived in the middle of a broken relationship? Sure, we all have. Something was said and something was heard. Something was done, something was felt, something was expected, someone was let down. And it's in the middle of, it's in the middle of those points, those gaps, that relationship breaks. When relationship gets broken, it's not just wreckage that takes place, things get lost. Things like peace and joy and hope and love. Trust. Things get found, other things, bitterness, anger, spite, malice, fear. When a relationship gets broken, we make broken choices. Because we don't have the ability to fix a relationship, we can only break it more. And usually we choose taking those broken pieces apart and separating them further. And separation often leads to the death of the relationship. Romans 5.12 says this, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, 
So death spread to everyone, for everyone, in effect, as a result, sinned. Step three, we're pretty good at wrecking relationships. We can't fix them, so we make them worse. Long story short, in the beginning, God created the human race, or created everything, including the human race, and God declared everything good, including the human race. Then the humans disobeyed God, and their disobedience resulted in a broken relationship with God. But God sent Jesus, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God sent Jesus to pay the price for our, for our broken relationship and offer restoration to anyone, anyone, anyone who will accept it. This is where the story turns. But God, Romans 5, 8 through 11, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now, we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has reconciled us with God. He's put it back together. Step four. But God showed up and fixed our relationship with him. That's the long story short version of the entire Bible. So what happens in your story, your personal story, when everything breaks? When relationships break, when your hopes and dreams break, when your health breaks or your work and source of income breaks or gets broken for you, what happens then? What happens in your story when you get absolutely buried by defeat, wreckage, pain, doubt? What happens when your heart is torn? What happens when the questions keep oppressing, keep oppressing, keep oppressing, keep oppressing, keep oppressing you? What happens when God doesn't listen and doesn't answer and doesn't show up? Because if we're going to be honest, that's how it feels when everything gets broken, like God isn't even there. That's why this story matters. That's why your relationship with the Bible is important. It's why it can make a difference in your life because this is the story of God's rescue mission for you and me and the entire human race. And you can find yourself in this story. When all you can see is wreckage in your life and there's no faith left and no hope and no confidence that your situation can ever change, you can find yourself again and again inside this story. And you can, be, you can be reminded that God is able to handle whatever you're facing. When evil is ruthless and relentless, we can find ourselves in the story of Noah, whom God rescued while a world full of wickedness was being flushed down the toilet. Noah found himself in the story by trusting when God said, hey, build a boat here in a land where rain's never yet fallen before. Build a boat. And he trusted God. When the rug gets yanked out from under you and we're left with no job and no prospects and very little hope and our, hope, our lives seem to be hanging by a thin thread, we can find ourselves in the story of Joseph, whom God remembered and lifted to a place of influence and authority so he could rescue the perishing. Joseph found himself in the story by waiting, waiting, waiting patiently, and continuing to believe that God's going to show up, he's going to fulfill the promises he's made. Or, when we get news that shatters our lives, everything that we expected, and our plans and <coughs> purposes, our lives are turned upside down, we can find the ourselves in the story of a young girl who was visited by an angel. 
figs from the creator of the universe. God has anointed you and chosen you and is surprising you with a wonderful gift. Mary, you're pregnant. Ouch. What could be possibly worse for a first century young Jewish girl than that kind of news? The most earth-shattering, engagement-entering, life-altering news that she could have heard, and yet Mary's response was completely at peace. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've told me come to pass just as you have said. Where does a teenage girl get that kind of confidence? How? She had a secure relationship with God. And how do you get that secure in your relationship with God? Well, she had found her place in the story, and you can too. Your relationship with God is repairable, it's fixable, it can be restored. Wherever it's broken, no, we can't fix it, you can't fix it, I certainly can't fix it. But God did already. That's why he sent his son Jesus to pay the price to restore our broken relationship with God. Yours and mine. On top of that, your relationship with God can be so completely secure that when he moves in ways that are different than what we prayed for, you can rest in the unshakable assurance that he's continuing to work everything for your good. So how do you get there? Because we're told all the time, read the Bible. Get into the Bible. Read the Bible. That dusty book, read that. That one that you disconnect, get into that. How do we do this? Where do we start? Here's an idea. Start small. First, select a tool. If you like to read, grab a Bible. It could be any Bible. If you like to read... Uh, and you don't have a Bible, get the YouVersion app. It's free. You can download it directly onto your phone. If you'd rather listen, you can use that same YouVersion app, or you can go to BibleGateway.com. Tons of versions on there that have audio, and you can actually listen to the Bible. Step two, choose a version. If you've got a, a physical Bible and you want to read that, great, that'll work perfectly. The version is not as important as doing something. But if you jump into that YouVersion app or Bible Gateway, there's, there's a whole mess of versions, and that can be overwhelming at first. If you don't have one that you prefer, check out the New Living Translation, the NLT. It's an easier Bible to read, and it'll get you into God's Word a step at a time. Third, pick a place to begin. Guess what? It doesn't matter. You can start at the beginning, you could read it front to back like an entire book, but keep in mind, this is a collection of books and writings and songs and letters, and it's all been put together, and there's an order to it so that we can figure out where the preacher guy is coming from, but it doesn't matter. If you're simply trying to start with a small step, then I'd recommend either Genesis, which is the very beginning, but after that, jump somewhere. Or the Psalms, which are songs. Or John, the book of John and the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Pick one of those places and start. Step four, pick a spot to end. Why do we get overwhelmed? Sometimes we just don't do this, and that word should keeps popping up. Well, I should be, I should, I... Forget should for a minute. Just pick a spot to end. Maybe you read one verse. Maybe you read a chapter. Maybe you read for three minutes, or 10, or 30. Pick away a spot to end, and stop there. There's no wrong method. Finally this, figure out a time that works for you. Perhaps you'll read over breakfast, or just before bedtime. Maybe you'll listen while you get ready in the morning, or on your commute. Maybe you'll come back to it at the end of the day. Maybe it'll be three days later when you finally come back to it. That's fine. When you come back to it, maybe you start and pick up where you, you left off and you kept going, or maybe you go back because that part was so good that you want to do that again. Fine. There's no wrong way. 
If it wasn't connecting with you at all, jump to something different. Just scratch that and move on. There's no wrong way. Pro tip, asking God for help is a good idea. This is his Bible, his word, his relationship. And as scripture already showed us, a relationship with the Bible is a relationship with God. This is what you're building. So ask God for help. Lord, help me understand something in this. Lord, help me get started. Father God, this is boring. Help me find a different place. It doesn't matter if you're trying. It's not a sign of weakness or confusion. It's just plain good sense. This is his relationship with you and your relationship with him. Scripture said God is the giver of all good gifts. Having a secure, a a strong, a, a developed relationship with his word and with God is the greatest gift we can ever receive. Last thing, renew your relationship with the word of God. Get rid of the word should. That should have no place in the middle of your relationship with God and his word. This is not a contest. This is an opportunity to build your relationship with the creator of the universe. There's an epic story with your name on it that's just waiting for you to stand up, find your place in the story, step into it. Let's pray. Father, if we're being honest, your word sure isn't a bright, shiny object. It's not a squirrel that distracts our attention. It's this dull, unpolished thing that has been around forever and familiarity, we know, it breeds contempt and so sometimes we just want to ignore this. Besides, it's hard. And yet, we're really interested in developing a relationship with you. Knowing what the Bible is about, the fact that it's a rescue mission and that in spite of you seeing us as good and then us breaking off with that and you coming back to save us, we have a lot to be thankful for. The fact that you've opened up the opportunity for any one of us who desires to be your kids to say, okay, I'm going to follow you. No magic prayer, no special verse to read, nothing other than following you. But as we do that, give us an interest in the Bible. Give us a hunger to hear your words. Give us a desire to know you better and how we can intersect and connect and take our place in your story that you designed before the very beginning. I ask for each of us today that we would try, that we would start small, that we would find a place to get into your word so that we could step into the story that you've designed for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Michael's going to come. We're going to participate in communion today. So as he does that, I invite you to take communion with us. When you came in this morning, you should have found a communion um, the juice and the bread in your chair. If you don't have one, we have extras, so just make sure you have one, okay? It's, it's interesting, as Pastor Steve was preaching, um, I was thinking about a couple of things as he's talking about. I did something different this week that I don't, we have, Lori and I have not normally done. Um, this is the first time we are going to celebrate communion as a, as a congregation for a very long time. We normally do it once a month, but since the COVID um, pandemic has taken place, we haven't done communion as a, as, a, as a church, as a fellowship, as brothers and sisters in Christ for a very long time. This week, I, I got on the scale um, at home, and uh, Planet Fitness has been closed for about three, however long they've been closed. So I got on the scale, looked at the scale, was really depressed, and uh, I've gained nine pounds in the last three, three months. And there's a point to why I'm telling you this, Okay. Next thing is, Lori and I, we have not had a lot of alone time together. 
um, just her and I. We have kids. We had a grandkid. Um, so we decided just to go to Yellowstone. So fr- we planned it on Saturday. I'm one of these guys. I love to change plans. So fr- Friday, coming home from work, I said, honey, let's just leave now. I found a, a hotel for $88. Let's just go. She was questioning, is it okay to stay at this hotel? Um, so on and so forth. Perfectly fine. We're from Kansas. We've stayed at worse. So the thing is, I, I, we had so much time just in a car, eight hours together, just talking and fellowshipping with one another, being able to describe our dreams, describe where we want to go, where we're going in ministry, where our kids are at. And I, I want you to understand that fellowship, the word also is translated communion. And communion is a part of the Christian faith, that when we come together as, as brothers and sisters, as we, li- as we worship corporately, as we listen to the word of God being preached, and as we take communion, we are doing this as the fellowship of brothers and sisters together. There are times that we, we stand before God and we don't know what to offer. We, we look at ourselves, we look at our weight, we look at our appearance, and we look at all the different things, and we think this, this cannot measure up before God. And as Pastor C said, you are perfect in the sight of God. You are holy and blameless before Him. Doesn't matter how you look, doesn't matter how much you weigh, doesn't matter what's taken place before. What communion is about is us offering ourselves to Him, coming before Him, knowing that we are sinners, repenting of our sins, and being saved by a great Savior. As we're going to take the, the cups, this is going to be a little different. I want you to undo the top part, and there the bread is. Oh my goodness. Maybe I should have mine pre-done. We have extra ones right there. Yeah, please raise your hand if you need communion. The little wafer that is hard to get out. Of. And I hear some people still struggling. Star, yeah, the styrofoam. But this represents Jesus' body. That he, he, he put upon, that he desired, that he, that he willed, that God willed his life to die for you and I. Let's take together. The juice represents Jesus' blood, the blood that was shed upon the cross for you and for me. This is a symbol of what he did upon the cross. Let's take it together. We have just did the act of communion together. We have just did the act of fellowship together. And now I want you to do something for with me is raise your little cup above your hand, above your hand, above your, your head, and I want you to crush it. And that is what Jesus did upon the cross for your sins and for mine. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the day. We thank you, Lord, for the death of the burial and the resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we have in you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you, God, for the fellowship we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ here. Lord, thank you for not looking upon our imperfection, but thank you for looking at the perfection we have in you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I would ask you, as you discard, as you exit today, if you would throw your communion um, trash in the trash so we don't have to touch it. Thanks. Would you stand with us again?
I just need to make one quick announcement. Um, there is going to be a prayer vigil at Bunning Park tonight. Uh, several churches have gotten together. Uh, the vigil is in support of law enforcement and our black communities. Pastor Nate's going to share a word and several other ministers. I'll be there around 5, 530 myself, and I'd love to see some of you guys' faces there to support our community, okay? 
Uh, I, I don't take any responsibility for what's said. I'm just saying I'm going to be there as a prayer warrior, okay? All right? The other thing is, is if anyone has a tub of Gatorade would like to dunk that over Steve as he leaves, that would be great. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for such a good word for today. Thank you, Lord, for uh, how you delivered it and how you brought that into such a clear perspective for us. I thank you that your word toward us is good. I thank you that everything and every thought you have toward us is good. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us this week to remember that our God is good and that our circumstances may be challenging and they may be what they are, but it doesn't change who you are. Our circumstances will never change who you are nor your heart toward us. So I pray, Lord, that you strengthen this body and help us to walk in the confidence of a Father's love and to love the people in our lives, our families, and our community out of his love and his approval. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Woo. All right, number one. Glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory.